it's a great pleasure and an honor for me to to introduce our our next speaker and panelist Jeet Thail. He absolutely needs no introduction but purely by by way of protocol. I've got a couple of lines here. Um Jeet Thail has worked as a journalist for over 21 years in Mumbai or as he prefers it Bombay, Bangalore, Hong Kong and of course New York. The first installment of his Bombay trilogy, which is called Narcopolis, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize and was a bestseller. His book of poems, These Errors Are Correct, which is in fact the, the title of this session, that won the Sahitya Academy Award and his musical collaborations included several works, such as the opera Barber that was performed in London. And, and he's going to be in conversation with John Wilkinson, professor of creative writing at University of Chicago. Before I hand it over to John, I just wanted to um, share a little anecdote. I mean, it's it's like this: poetry festival organizers and 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 directors, not unlike poets, have their own ambitions. And one of my ambitions for this inaugural edition was to have a literary superstar, such as G. Thayed, be part of the festival. And initially, when I had the, the first set of, sort of exchanges and correspondence with G, G. said, um, in what form, what medium are you going to do this? I said, well, well in, in keeping with the times, and this was last year, we're going to do it hybrid. So we'll have somebody here um, from you, Chicago, and you can join in online wherever you are. And Jeet said, I would much prefer if this is in person. Uh, there's really been this proliferation of online sessions and online poetry festivals and online everything, readings, everything online and remote. Uh, I'm not particularly fond of it. And I was a bit crestfallen. And we, we sort of kept Jeet's slot in limbo, in anticipation, in hope. And lo and behold, literally, I think 15 days back, 20 days back, I received, Lena and I receive an email from Jeet saying, guys, is the festival still on? I said, yes, but with the same constraint. And Jeet said, no, but I'm going to be in Delhi. I said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll reach out for everything. We'll make sure that you're able to, to do this event with us. So I'm, I'm so very happy that you're here. Um, Jeet. Thank you very much, and uh, and I hope from your slot in limbo you're going to ascend to heaven rather than descend to hell. Well, you know, it's a Dantean equation. You you never know. Hell might be better. Oh, for sure. Okay. You might have more friends there. You know, all the poets are going to be there. Yeah, for that's sure. Likely. That's like the critics might be there as well. But in a different circle, I hope. I think I think a lower circle. <laughs> okay. So um, I noticed in an interview you gave last year that you mentioned that you were working on a new book of poems, um, long awaited, I think. Um, so I'd like to start by inviting you to talk about that book and if you have any of that work with you and are willing to share it, to do so. Thanks so much, yeah. Uh, first new book of poems in 15 years. I never thought that this would happen, I thought uh, Poems had given me up, um, but apparently not. And uh, I, I have to say, these are a really strange bunch of poems, for me at least. And I, I think uh, reaching the advanced age of 63 might have something to do with it. These are poems where I, I think the only way to think about it is they are um, I don't care anymore poems. You know, where you're really not trying to write a poem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because we do do that. We try and write poetry the way we've heard it. And I think, uh, I think young poets especially do that, you know. And um, I wish I'd reached this point earlier, but you can't rush it. And here we are with poems that really don't seem to <laughs> care so much. It's called Lake Style, isn't it? I think that might be it, exactly, yeah. Painters are subject to that as well, aren't they? Uh, this is a book called Diminishing Marginal Utility. Um, just because I've, I've always disliked poetic titles, you know, 
Um, I like preludes. It just says what it is. I like a title that... I like poems. You know, there's so many books of poems called poems. It just tells you what it is. So, uh, diminishing mar marginal utility is a, a phrase I learned in economics. Because uh, I did do a economics course uh, for A-levels in Hong Kong many, many years ago. And I think the only thing that I retained was the idea of diminishing marginal utility, which is the idea that the first time you do something that you enjoy, on the graph it will be right up on top. But the second time you do it, even if it's, especially if it's immediately, or in an hour or so, it, there's a huge drop in terms of what you get out of it. Um, so that's the name of the book, for better or for worse. And here's the title poem. The first cigarette is all you've got. From the second, it's a downhill trot. You might as well not smoke it, so little does it satisfy. You might as well stroke it like a pet, sniff it and say, oh my. This is the law of farm, forest and city, rapidly diminishing marginal utility. Once learned, never forgotten, applicable, alas, to everything. Kisses, earthquakes, the nobly rotten, cars, guitars, bliss on the wing. Sunsets on Mars are blue, sometimes purple too. An octopus dreaming changes color from pale to yellow to camouflage to black. Its suckers light up, synapses follow. It has a large brain and a knack for the avoidance of pain. I'll never eat octopus again. Utility doesn't always diminish in value. It can start at the bottom of the graph never to rise, never to accrue gains or losses. Go ahead and laugh. I don't care poems. I'll give you one more, uh, because these really are of a piece. Uh, this is called Christie Street, and uh, that's a street in, in New York, uh, the Lower East Side, where I lived for a few years when uh, I was doing a MFA at uh, Sarah Lawrence in poetry, Sarah Lawrence College, which is in sort of downstate New York. Uh, and I had no money, and I had to uh, get a job with the worst newspaper in the world. It was an Indian newspaper in New York, a kind of a Desi newspaper that basically was a conduit for um, matrimonial advertisements and lawyers' advertisements, which makes complete sense, right? So the matrimonial advertisements were according to caste, and the lawyers' advertisements were obviously for immigrants to get their status straight. So I lived on a street called Christie Street, um, and really the only advantage of living on Christie Street was the rent, which was as I remember, $600 a month for a one room in a storefront. And it was uh, surprisingly comfortable. Anyway, this is Christie Street. There's a Whole Foods on the corner, I hear. A notion so outlandish, so weird, I can't square it with that street where food was cheap but a mistake to eat. Not whole or wholesome, just unfit. It wasn't much of a street, an extension of Second Avenue and its pass across the Great Wall of Houston, Houston, not Hughes or Haas. Are we clear on that, hun? For a summer, it was the famed tenement storefront that made an appearance in Spider-Man, the first installment of Sam Raimi's trilogy about the genius and orphan Peter Parker, a scene so fleet most viewers missed it. I mourned Peter's exile on Christie Street as I mourned my own. 
and I longed for his hero's return as I longed for my own. Even if home was gone and my second and last wife was almost gone and the only thing my life was good for was going or gone. There was a shared bathroom at that Christie storefront, a small blue couch, a single lamp, a bookshelf against the red brick wall. That was all. I read John Clare and taught myself to smile. I did not fall into despondency. I fell into gladness, simplicity, carelessness of youth, a little poverty, not too much, some madness, not too much, and a glimpse of the truth that lay, I was sure, in the snowmelt underfoot. Thank you. That, that also resonates very strongly with me because I lived just below Houston for a year, further west, opposite a firehouse in a one-room apartment. I know that firehouse. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so it does occur to me that uh, the title of your book also applies to uh, a preoccupation apparent in your novels, which is around the character of addiction. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about the idea that um, you have this uh, diminished utility and diminished effect, uh, you don't have any diminution in desire for what it is that is diminishing. Um, so. Do you see that as connected, um, this, this um, idea of um, diminishing marginal utility with your writing about addiction? You know, I hadn't really thought of it in, within the context of addiction, but absolutely uh, that makes sense to me because, uh, you know, it's always a, a kind of an undercurrent, in, especially in the poems for some reason, more than in the novels, uh, especially uh, after Narcopolis. Uh, I think in I think the thing about poetry is, <coughs> as George was saying earlier, it's not something that's entirely in your control. You know, as you work on a poem, things come up that surprise you, or uh, certainly things should, mm -hmm. you know, that surprise you and scare you. And uh, I think if you're sensible, if you're a sensible poet, which of course poets are not, uh, what you should do is follow that, that fear or that kind of discomfort or that unease because it's going to take you somewhere that at the end of that discomfort will, be, will have been worth that journey. Uh, and I think that's that idea of the subconscious uh, leaking into a poem is absolutely something that I've always felt. And thank you for mentioning the idea of addiction in terms of diminishing marginal utility, because I think that does come up a lot in this book. What you just said, though, um, suggests to me also um, the title of an earlier book, which is and the title you've chosen for this talk, which is that the errors are correct. Yeah. You, you follow what yeah. you, makes you uncomfortable that you can't deal with. And that turns out to be the right way for the poem to go. Uh, so um, I'm interested. Uh, I think this might apply to all kinds of writing, actually, not only poetry. Uh, it might. I mean, to writing that's worth reading. You, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go where the, the fear is. Uh, reading low as I did recently, I was struck that at one point you refer to poetry, and of course this is in uh, in character rather than authorials. Well, I wanted to know to what extent you would hold to this, that poetry represents some kind of a protection. Um, and see if I can find this. The enclosed and protected world of the poem. And I wondered what you meant by that, and whether you see potentially poetry as um, like drugs or alcohol or Trump, who is another um, protective yeah. drug in that book, yeah. um, as something which fulfills some of the same function as um, and, and, uh, is, is part of the world of addiction too. Yeah. Very much. In fact, the, the character in Lowe um, admires Trump yeah. and depends on Trump for a kind of, uh, in fact, for the same kind of um, consolation 
that poetry provides, which is a protected space where you feel um, separate from the world, from the real world, where you feel that laws don't apply, and where uh, anything really is possible without consequences. You know? <laughs> I, I think, you know, this is the great uh, uh, misapprehension under which addicts operate, that there are no consequences. And of course there are, and of course those consequences occur so much later that uh, by then you will have no way to hold them down or, or prevent them. But while the, the addiction is happening, while the poem is happening, while you're listening to Trump uh, spout those magic realist kind of uh, ideas, there is a pleasure, you know, it's a fleeting pleasure, but it's there. And I think, uh, you know, I think, I have to say, I miss Trump, you know. And, and I, I'm, these days I'm addicted very much to CNN. Uh, whenever he comes up on CNN, of course, the first uh, instinct is, what? When you hear what he's saying, you know, what? How can this be possible? But then there's a, a pleasure that arrives despite your better self and uh, I, don't, I don't understand it but there it is. As, as I was reading low I started substituting the, the, the horrible Russian drug croc for the name tr Trump <laughs> as I was going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. in fact I've seen some videos about, about the effects of that drug and yeah I can see the connection. <laughs> When, when I was last in India a few years ago, I was very struck that all of the drivers that we had would talk admiringly about Trump. And I was very puzzled about this and why people were so infatuated by Trump. Do you have any uh, clue about that? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, if you compare him... Look, th the thing about fame and celebrity, and Indians are incredibly... Um, we, are, we are into celebrity, you know. We love celebrities, you know, and it doesn't matter what wing or what color or, you know, what kind of politics they, they might. It, celebrity is a kind of race all by itself, or it's a, it's a caste all by itself. And the thing about Trump was he knew how to use celebrity in a way Biden does not. You know, Trump understood what celebrity means, that it's an image, that what your politics really are and whether you're a good person or a, 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 a terrible person for the planet doesn't really matter. It's about how you speak and how you project this image. He understood that from day one, from the day that he came down that golden escalator, you know, yeah. <laughs> with his wife. <laughs> I mean, what a start to the most uh, traumatic four years in the history of the United States and perhaps in the world, you know. And maybe we're due for another one. We'll find out. Uh, I'll return to poetry in a moment, but just following through from, from some of that. Reading low, I was also um, thinking about um, the uh, writing William Burroughs about the centrality of addiction to capitalist culture and wondering how that had changed. And you partly answered that. I think that since Burroughs, the drug of celebrity has become so much more potent than it was at the time that he was writing. Well, also, he talked about the drug of control. For him, drugs, heroin really, was a, a method of control. It, it was an overt way to control consciousness and to control human behavior. And, of course, then he widened that to the entire capitalist enterprise. And I think uh, time seems to have borne that out. I agree. That certainly figures. Uh, so, returning to, to poetry, one thing that um, really struck me as I tried to prepare to, to meet you in England, which is where I'm living at present, um, I, I tried to obtain your poems, and I was quoted four weeks by Amazon, and I couldn't. And it, I was very struck that you are internationally published and hugely successful in many formats, and presumably translated all over the world as a novelist. 
And there is a question for me about the way in which English language poetry travels across borders. And I'm curious because there is such a, a, a passionate interest in acts of translation from other languages into English in both the United States and Britain, but an extraordinary resistance to poetry written in English from other nations. And there is still this sort of peculiar um, national fixation when it comes to poetry written in English. It seems to have this kind of you know, boundary around it. Is that something that you experience or have bumped up against? I mean, uh, very interesting you should say that because this applies very much in India. Poetry written in regional languages as opposed to poetry written in English. In English. And this is a, a kind of a, a war that has been in process for uh, more than 100 years now where uh, a poet who writes in Malayalam, say, or Gujarati, or Bengali, or Marathi, uh, has a kind of instant um, um, ownership of authenticity, which is something the poet who writes in English will never have, and has to fight for, and has to... Uh, explain and defend and uh, conquer, you know, and own in a way that no regional language poet will ever be made to do. And it's, it's a, a debate that's been going on, in fact, uh, less now than it was, say, in the mid-20th century, at which point uh, all the poets who fought that fight, Nisim Ezekiel, Dom Marais, A.K. Ramanujan, uh, Kamala Das, Eunice D'Souza, Arun Kolatkar, Arvind Krishna Mehrotra, Adil Jasawala. All these guys fought that fight for about 30 years, from the 50s to about the 80s. Mm -hmm. It's still going on, but they had the worst of it. Where before you could read a poem in English, you had to defend it. And you had to uh, say that you were, you were really a poet. It, it is poetry. It just happens to be in English because that is your language. Uh, the, the poets that I mentioned, English is for them as much their language as their mother tongues. And this is something that you still have to talk about. So when you, when you put that into an international context, and these days, by the way, it's not just poetry, it's fiction as well. Translated literature from all over the world is having its moment. And thank God for that, because it really it's time that that happened. Um, I think in time, poetry written in English will also have its moment internationally. In, from India, I mean. Mm -hmm. you know, so. Do you then think that um, the ambivalence that a writer in English, or maybe the almost unhoused feeling that a writer in English has in India is to an extent an advantage for um, that poet. In other words, it's not just a matter perhaps of the colonial history, but also of English as the current language of financialization and so on. Uh, so from the very beginning, a poet is in a contesting or ambivalent relationship to English, even if like me, you're English. You know. yeah. I think that is a, a truth about poetry in general. Poets are the original outsiders, the original outcasts, you know, and I think that is one of the reasons we revere poets. One of the reasons we revere poets and poetry is because we know that this is one endeavor that is separate from the making of money. It's as far removed from capitalism as it's possible to get. You know, it's got nothing to do with capitalism. If somebody goes into poetry to make money, that person needs therapy. They need, um, you know, uh, a, a very close look at their mental health. We know that the one thing poetry will not be associated with is money. So th that, I think, is one of the reasons why poets right from the beginning, from when they are young, know that they are somehow outside. And then when you write in English in a country where English is not supposed to be your mother tongue, whatever a mother tongue might 
B, I, I'm still not sure. Uh, um, I mean, I know what my mother's tongue is, and I know that my mother tongue is not my mother's tongue. Uh, I think it prepares you when you're outside in that way that poets are. I think it prepares you for a kind of neglect, for the fact that uh, your books will always be out of print. Yes, that's true, although there is a sort of paradoxical side to this. I remember when I taught my first creative writing class to an MFA class at Notre Dame, and I naively asked the students why they wanted to write poetry. And I went around the class and I was shocked by the responses, which were essentially, I want to be a professor of creative writing. Uh, so I think that there are other corrupting influences oh besides money. <laughs> and amusingly, when we have looked, for example, for people to chair our creative writing program, we always end up with poets. Um, and that's partly because, I mean, it's disturbing to find that poets have become the most responsible citizens of the American university. This is true, though. I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it's absolutely true. I know I was, you know, part of an American university and that university system for, for some years, and, and I could see that happening, that uh, poets and good poets mm -hmm. had been co-opted into that kind of uh, system. But in a way, of course, it was a wonderful thing because, you know, you're talking... Right from, say, Theodore Rothke, Lowell, Berryman, all these guys who, if they had not been given jobs at, by universities, would have died far earlier than they did. Would, you know, the, really it was the university job that kept them alive for as long as, even though their lives could have been extended, you know, uh, Delmo Schwartz. All those poets, and Sexton, Bishop, although she lived in Mexico, and she would come into the United States every once in a while to do one of those tours, which gave her all the money that she didn't make while she was living in Mexico. I mean, you know, I, let's not trash the <laughs> MFA programs because they've done something wonderful. They've given poets, at least American poets, they've given them, uh, you know, money, which helps when you, you're engaged in something that makes no money. And I, interestingly, the, the poets in America who have taken jobs in academia, many of them have continued to write, you know, have continued to produce um, wonderful books that have stayed within the vein that they began. I'm thinking of someone like Thomas Lux, for example, you know, who if you look at his early books, like, uh, for example, Sunday, very strange poems that even after teaching for 30 years uh, in the MFA programs in two universities, he somehow managed to keep going. He never stopped writing. And I think uh, for him, as for uh, many other American poets I can think of, uh, the, the teaching of poetry helped the writing of poetry. That's a that's a, a admirable thing, and that's something uh, you have to give them. No, I entirely agree, and I think it's important that um, universities, or at least some universities, have uh, confidence to make their own independent aesthetic judgments when they're making appointments, and will give employment to people who are not obviously popular writers or or, or even writers, not popular and not even fully. In their senses, yeah. you know, that's right. Lowell. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also I feel that the uh, uh, opportunity for all students to be able to encounter some or have some experience of creative writing is important, yeah. so long as they don't get too deluded yeah. as a result of that. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely, because uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the point about an MFA program is when you're a young writer, you go into a class and you see a poet who is, say, 50 or 60, it, it's not really about the poems. It's about the poet. And it's, it gives you an idea uh, how to be a writer in the world. And when you're young, when you're 20 or 25, that's something you have no clue about. How, how can you be a writer in the world? It's just so... 
impossible. The, but that's an interesting qu um, question to ask because the model there is you are a writer in the world if you are on the campus, yeah. uh, which is a little problematic, I think. Sure. I, I do wonder sometimes what the effect will be of the gradual running down that we're seeing of humanities programs in the yeah. States yeah. and whether we're going to see um, a, a whole cohort of intellectuals who have not been absorbed into the university system who have become a kind of basis for um, a new left opposition, but I'm being too hopeful of that. that, that that's, a, that's kind of a dream. Uh, I think that's a poem. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, you're, a write, you're both a novelist and um, a poet, and I've noticed that many Indian writers are both novelists and poets. Many of the most important poets are also novelists. In the States, poets tend to stick to their own lines, although some masquerade as scholars, um, but they tend to hold their own lines. Why do you think there might be that distinction? And also, what relationship do you see between your writer, your, your life as a poetry writer, and your life as a novelist? Thanks for that. I, I think it's very simple and very prosaic. It's to do with money. It's to do with making a living. Uh, the reason so many Indian poets are also novelists is because if you write a good book of poems, it will get you about 30,000 rupees from the best publisher in the country. 30, if you're very lucky, 40. Which is not going to pay your rent for one month, you know. Um, so poets in India they can't turn to academia because there are no MFA programs. I think there might be one university in the country that has it, maybe two, but that's it. You can't turn to academia for, to make a living. <clears throat> so if you want to be a writer, what do you do? You write the only kind of literature that actually can make you an income, and that is fiction. Um, so I think that's why so many Indian writers Indian poets also write fiction, whereas in America, poets write poetry because they can keep that private, separate, protected. They don't need to do the other thing. They can go do a workshop twice a week or three times a week, do a lecture on Plato, and that will keep them going. That is not an option here, which is why so many Indian poets also write novels. And this applies to all the languages, by the way. And uh, the difference between the two, second part of your question, uh, for me at least, it's very simple. Poetry is something that you do in a burst of enthusiasm, in a burst of energy. It might take you a few days, it might take a week, you might keep revising it for weeks or months, but that initial thing happens in a burst. And it's such tremendous fun. There's time stops. You're lost. You think about nothing else. You follow that. And, and it has an ending. It has a beginning. It has an end. Pretty fast. You see the results of your labor immediately or almost immediately. With a novel, it's a whole other thing. It's drudgery. It's a nine-to-five job. You have to sit there every day and keep at it even when you don't want to, even if you don't feel like it. You go to it like you go to a job. Even if you have that initial burst of inspiration, that burst of energy and enthusiasm that makes you get into it, you have to then put that engine in, which is that engine of labor. And there's nothing fun about that part of it. You know, so for me, it really is just very, very clear. Uh, the poetry is a dance, and uh, prose is its opposite, its labor. In response to your response to the first part of that, I don't get the sense that your fiction is motivated only by the need to make a living. It Unfortunately not. Powerfully motivated. Um, so maybe you could talk about why it's, you know, how it's powerfully motivated. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it's very clear it's not uh, motivated 
by the idea of profit because, you know, just uh, the nature of the work is not uh, going to make it um, popular in that way. Um, the thing is, I came to it very late. I, I worked as a journalist for 20 years in various parts of the world, and I, I gave it up at the age of 45. I moved from New York to New Delhi with the idea of living poor. Uh, one thing about being an Indian is that you can always count on your parents uh, to give you a room and to give you breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you know, that's a, it's a given. You never have to, you know, even ask for it. You can always move back home. There's always a room for you, and there's always going to be food on the table for you. So it occurred to me at the age of 45, I admit, a bit late in life, but, you know, I wish it had occurred earlier, but it didn't. It occurred to me at 45, I could quit this job. I could go to India. I could take a risk and write the novel I've been wanting to write my whole life which is what I did. I lived poor for several years. Uh, when the first novel appeared, I was 50 years old. You know, so I think at that point, you're not motivated by wanting to see your book at the airport bookshop, you know, or uh, wanting a bestseller, or, or to make uh, two crores, you know, and to make, write one of those three book deals where they give you five crores to write three books, which certain writers, you know, do. It's not going to be what pushes you. What's going to push you is to do the thing that you've always wanted to do and never had the financial uh, means, that space where you could take yourself away from the noise of life for six hours a day. You know. And I think that is what happened to me very late in life. Narcopolis came out when I was 51, actually. So at that point, you know, uh, even if, I, I think it's true what they say, even if you, there comes a point where even if you make a huge amount of money, if, if you were to win the lottery, for example, it's not fundamentally going to change your lifestyle you're still going to do what you do. You might just have a little less anxiety about it, you know, but it's not going to change you in any fundamental way. And I, I think uh, for a writer, that might be uh, an extraordinary benefit. I'm just thinking back to the poems that you read at the start and how just tightly constructed they are. And they appear almost as, as intricate mobiles, and how different that is from the extraordinary narrative pace of your novels. Um, time is very differently felt in the poems and in the novels. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you feel deliberately about, that you try to get that kind of pace into the novel and that um, narrative force? but that in the poem you want something which feels semi-autonomous. Yeah, yeah I, I think, in fact, the, this, in this new book, the speed with which these poems have been written, it, it, they're written very fast, sometimes in a day or, in fact, in a few hours. And that's something very new for me. Because in, in the earlier books, I mean, there are... Uh, these errors are correct, for example. There are some poems, the canzone, the, uh, the sestinas, that took weeks and months of revision. You know, That's not the case with these poems. They, they occur very fast. So in terms of pace, in fact, the poems are fast. And I think, uh, although they're very formal in, in terms of stanza length and rhyme and uh, even scansion, uh, very formal. They, they happen so quickly, and I think uh, there's something about even when you're reading them, you get that sense of speed, uh, which, interestingly enough, there are passages in, in the novels that occurred in the same way. 
you know, that were written so fast. And I think that has something to do with uh, poets in general. Poets put more work into poetry than they do into prose. You know, Richard Hugo, the great American poet, once said that uh, the only thing I've ever worked hard on is a poem. And he said that at the age of 60-something, when he had held many jobs and written prose, you know. The only thing I've ever worked hard on is a poem. I think, uh, I think that's something all poets would agree with. So your description of the, the new poems leads me to ask whether this is a connected set of poems or sequence, or whether their relationship is fortuitous as they come to you, so to speak. Very much fortuitous. And uh, there are, I think, two sections in, in this book. One it, it has the, the quality I was talking about earlier, the um, I don't care quality. A and the other is more, uh, it's sort of less mocking, um, more heartfelt, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'd just like to ask you a question about your work as an anthologist, to turn to another of your uh, uh, distinctions. And uh, talking about the, the recent uh, uh, Penguin uh, Book of Indian Poets, you uh, talk about a perception that Indian poetry has shaken off the British influence, which was evident in the 80s and 90s, and is now responsive to new technologies and is ranging not only um, across um, many borders, um, but is also ranging across identities and taking account of gender fluidity and so on. And since I was only able to glance at this before um, it was hidden behind a paywall, um, I'd like you to expand on it a little bit for the, for the audience. The, something very uh, unexpected and uh, gratifying has happened in terms of Indian poetry. For so many years, uh, poets had to penetrate a kind of a paywall, a, a, an impenetrable gate held by a handful of gatekeepers, you know. And uh, I'm thinking of the Bombay poets who were so in the 70s and 80s, who were so, uh, who guarded their corner of a corner of the corner of the poetry world so jealously and would not allow you to even sit at the porch, much less enter the, you know, the main dining room, uh, unless you had paid your dues. And by that, uh, for some reason, the, the poets I'm thinking of, um, the paying of dues involved not publishing. Just so perverse, you know. It, it meant writing one book and then doing nothing for 10 years or something. And a lot of them did that, you know. The books were so infrequent. And of course it had something to do with the fact that uh, publishing poetry was not easy at that time. Publishers were not into uh, having, say, two, ti two poetry titles a year. It just wasn't feasible. And because of that, the, the kind of vibe that created among poets, it was very, very difficult if you were a young poet uh, in your 20s or in your 30s to, to even imagine having a book of poems. It was a, it was a difficult thing to do. Uh, and there was no other possibility of publication. There were very few literary journals. You could send to journals in other countries, but you know it was a long process, and uh, so there was no possibility of writing a poem and seeing it in print within, say, a year or even two. Yeah, so that has changed completely because of the internet. There are young poets writing now who will publish a poem on Instagram or Facebook. Um, and will instantly get responses. And the thing is, I mean, I, I wouldn't uh, recommend being the kind of poet who publishes on Instagram, but I completely get it. I understand why poets do it. And there are some very good poets, young poets, 
who are doing that, who are publishing on Instagram. Um, and I think that's going to keep happening. And uh, the wonderful thing about that is that it's taken the power away from those gatekeepers of poetry. And uh, I can't wait to see what, what will happen once uh, you know, Instagram and Facebook and all these places where poets publish these days, once that explodes, because in the next five years or so, there's going to be f various other venues for publication. And I think there's going to be some kind of um, f some kind of formality will arrive. There will be standards, and I think there will be uh, other kinds of publication that follow on from that. It's a, I think it's a it's a wonderful time to be a young poet in India at this point, and that certainly wasn't the case thirty years ago. No, that that makes sense to me. It sounds also like what's happening with the district distribution of music and uh, poetry in the UK I'm conscious is going in the same direction as say Radiohead did putting you put out yeah. the yeah. exquisite object the vinyl with, with all kinds of uh, uh, graphic material and also you have the download you know you have the immediately streamed yeah. And uh, it's leading also to, I think, a revival of letterpress printing and so on. People want the souvenir object. They want yeah. the beautiful object. Yeah. And I think, I, I mean, I wish this, I wish uh, publishers would understand this, yeah. Indian publishers especially, that the point about poetry is that if you produce a beautiful object, a beautiful looking object with nice paper and a beautiful cover, you can price it fairly high and people will buy it. And I think that is a, a lesson, certainly that Penguin learned to their absolute shock and awe with this anthology. The Penguin Book of Indian Poets is a beautiful object. It has this kind of salmon pink cover. It has a beautiful photo of Eunice D'Souza in her kitchen, in unshowered in a house coat, smoking a cigarette with a parrot on her head. Just a stunning photograph. It's 900 pages. It's a big book on beautiful paper, beautifully printed. It is now in its third edition. Three editions have sold out within a year. And the fourth is coming. You know, this is, uh, I, at least for poetry publishing in India, that's uh, unheard of. And it has everything to do with the fact that they made a beautiful object. They didn't price it cheap. It's not, by Indian standards, it's not cheap. Although, if you think about it, 1,200 or 1,300 for a 900 page book of poems, that is cheap, if you ask me. Um, but it's sold and it's selling. And um, every once in a while, I'll go into a bookshop and ask if they have a copy. It's sold out. I think it will keep selling. Uh, and I think there's a lesson there for uh, publishers. Maybe we could just pursue the errors are correct a little bit more sure. and yeah. the actual practice of writing poetry because you're talking now about writing poems currently in a kind of rush. They're coming to you almost uh, fully formed. Fully formed yeah. So you don't have time to notice those errors that you might pursue or do you pursue them in a subsequent poem? Do, do they necessitate the pursuit of earlier errors? Well, the, the two poems I read earlier uh, at the beginning of our session, um, they're very much in keeping with uh, about half the book. And it's going to be a big book. It'll be about a hundred, 120 pages. Um, but about half of that book has that sound to it. Um, this kind of feigned insouciance. Uh, and... I think that what happened was um, I wrote a couple of these and they were a surprise to me um, and then I enjoyed it so much that I followed what those two poems had done and it just opened a kind of a, a gate. Mm. Well I'm glad to hear it's going to be a, a big book because I think that poets now can't rely upon any particular prior orientation in their readers and need to acculture their readers in a kind of larger form or 
to bring them into a particular um, kind of way of writing or reading the world. Absolutely. Also because our attention spans have been so fragmented, yeah. you know, because of the internet, because of social media, uh, that you can't expect literary memory to last any longer than a, a few months, maybe, you know? Well, uh, thank you, Jeet. That was uh, wonderful to hear you talk about your work and to he hear some of your new poems. And I hope that we'll see and hear more of them very soon. Thanks so much, John. Thank you for those wonderful questions.